Hi there, stranger. I know it's been a couple of weeks, but we are here today to chat about the few books I did manage to read in April, do a bit of a wrap up of the books and the stats. We're also going to have a bit of a chat about what's going on for me right now and why I'm not reading so much and how I'm feeling about it. But first, let's start with the books that I did read in April. I managed to finish five books for a total of 1,107 pages. So April is absolutely the slowest reading month I've had all year by quite a long shot. I think last month I read about 15 books. February was the same. Back in January, I read over 20. My average star rating was a 3.5, so pretty average. I read two novellas, two novels, and one graphic novel. As far as the target audience and the age category is concerned, two of the books that I read were adult books, one was a young adult, and two were middle grade. Now let's have a bit of a chat and a review of those five books. I'll start with the one that I liked least and then work my way up to the one that I liked the most. This first book is actually a book that I started reading and I started filming for like a reading vlog that I was planning on doing. And essentially the plan for that video was to read sci-fi but kind of like literary takes on sci-fi and that was Orbital by Samantha Harvey and this is just a short little novella and I thought it could be a really good pick for an experiment like that and in fact although I think I'm gonna have to put that video on hold until I can you know pick up my reading pace a little bit more again I did film my reaction to this book so I'm just gonna I'm gonna let past Katie tell you what she thought of this book so I have just finished Orbital by Samantha Harvey and I feel like I don't know if this is science fiction. And in a lot of ways, this book doesn't really feel like a book. It doesn't feel like a story. It like, there's no plot here whatsoever. And I know we all say like, no plots, just vibes, but literally not an ounce of plot. To me, this almost felt more like creative nonfiction or something. Essentially, we just spend the entirety of this book on the International Space Station with the six people who are currently living there. And we just spend the book talking about how beautiful Earth is from their perspective and all of the different complex range of emotions and thoughts that they have. So yes, we're getting to know these people. We're getting to learn a little bit about their dynamic and kind of like their motivations for becoming astronauts, all of that sort of stuff. We get a sense of the isolation and the claustrophobia, but also like the grand perspective that they have up there. But what this book spends more of its time on is kind of just like beautifully talking about the earth or beautifully talking about our place in the universe. And to be perfectly honest, I kind of was surprised that that stuff did not sweep me away because normally I'm a sucker for that kind of thing. And I keep coming back to two things. The first is that like this writing is very beautiful. It's lyrical, it's over the top, it's so descriptive and luscious, but in a way that made me never forget the author. Like the author's presence was always the one that I felt most strongly more than the other characters in the book, if that makes sense. And so even though I liked a lot of what the author was saying, it just, I don't know, it, I never sunk into it because the author's presence was first and foremost. The second thing I keep coming back to is the fact that a lot of the things that the like astronauts talk about or the narrator talk about to kind of like illustrate how amazing Earth is, um, is stuff that like I've heard Hank Green talk about. And so obviously if you've already been exposed to a lot of this, it doesn't feel quite as grand and beautiful and like mind blowing as I think the author wants it to feel. One example was that the author uses, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard where they say like the life of the universe, but they put it into like a calendar year. I first heard about this on SciShow, I think, or from Hank Green at the very least. It's basically a way of visualizing like the scope of the universe and the, the time frame of the universe and how small and tiny we are. I love it, I love that framing and I remember the first time I heard it, I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. So having to read it over the span of a couple of pages in here, I was kind of like, yeah, I know, I've heard this before. It's not having the impact on me that you want it to have. And there was just a lot, there was a lot of moments in this book just like that for me. So I don't know, I don't know if maybe the author is a Hank Green stan, I mean, I don't blame them. So it was lovely, but it just didn't hit me in any particular way. And I think those would be the two main reasons. And it's not that I disliked this book in any way, it's just one of those books that I'm going to forget that I read in a month or two. Speaking of forgettable, the next book, my second least favorite book, I actually don't have here to show you because I just borrowed it from work and I read it in one evening. And that was a young adult book called All That It Ever Meant. It's a pretty short young adult story exploring the experience of losing a family member, in particular, a mother. And so it's kind of just about family and about grief. It's not a very linear story and throughout our main character Marty, I think she's like the middle sibling from memory, uh, she's kind of talking to and exploring her grief with like we don't know whether it's like a, a spirit or a figment of her imagination or like like who this person is. But essentially that relationship is quite an important and interesting part of the book and basically it's just about processing grief. This isn't a bad book by any means but for me the writing style and 
the narrative just felt quite choppy and clunky. It was one of those books that just felt like it jumped around quite a lot and I didn't always feel situated in the moment and the emotions. So while I did like a lot of what this book was doing, I liked a lot of the elements, I really liked the characters, I, it just didn't quite come together in a super satisfying or emotionally resonant way for me. The next book that we've got is A Hat Full of Sky, which is the second book in the Tiffany Aching sequence in the Discworld series by Terry Pratchett. I enjoyed this well enough. I definitely didn't like it as much as the first book in the sequence that I read last month or the month before. But equally, a lot of the things that I said I liked about the first one were still in here, like the humor and the way that Terry Pratchett plays with like our ideas of common sense. I really like the way that things like death and mortality were experienced explored. So yeah, I liked it. I have book three. I will continue and try book three, but I don't know that I'm like fully in love with this series. Like I kind of hoped I would be by now. Next up, we have a book that I've been highly anticipating the release of. It's the sequel to a graphic novel that I loved. I think I read last year and it's the second book in the Lily Half Moon series. This book is called The Witch's Council. And this is just such a fun, cute little graphic novel series. The artwork in this is just so beautiful and I continue to love love the way that we have these kind of like textbook pages or like grimoire pages scattered throughout the story. This book in particular feels very witchy. We've got like information about tarot cards and the wheel of the year. So I continue to be of the opinion that this series is a bit of an underrated gem as far as children's graphic novels go. It's basically about a girl who was recently discovered in the first book that she she's a witch and in this book we continue to develop on some of the friendships that we made in the first book which I love. So it's a good balance of like the fantasy, the adventure, the magic with just really solid real friendships. It's really cute. I like it a lot and I'm looking forward to book three whenever we get that. Now finally we have my favorite book of April and if you watched my last video, I know it was a couple of weeks ago, but if you watched it you will know exactly what book that is and it is Lonely Castle in the Mirror. I hadn't read a five star since January so early April I was getting kind of fed up. I wanted a five star book so I asked you over on my community page to vote for a book that you thought I could give five stars and by quite a margin you voted for this book and you were right. I loved it. This is a Japanese fantasy novel. It's kind of like a portal fantasy and we meet our main character who isn't going to school anymore and we know that something kind of bad has happened to make her not want to go to school. When one day her mirror starts glowing and so she touches it and she gets transported into a magical castle. In there she meets some other kids who are also struggling at school but she also meets the Wolf Queen, this strange little girl wearing a wolf mask and says that this castle in the mirror is going to be here for them for the next year and they have a chance to try and find a key whoever finds a key gets a wish. There's a couple of other rules that go along with the magic. Think something like, you know, the setup for before the coffee gets cold. But that setup did happen quite quickly. And from there, we just get to know more about these kids, what's going on for them, why they're not going to school. And although this book is very slow, just like people say, I felt like it balanced perfectly, this beautiful sense of atmosphere with intrigue. I was intrigued from start to finish. I had questions about what was going on for these kids, what was happening with this castle in the mirror. And all of them and more were answered at the end of the book in such a satisfying but also emotionally impactful way. I literally sobbed. I was literally sobbing. I loved this book so much. And that reading vlog that I mentioned is a full spoiler filled review discussion of the book. So if you'd like some of those questions answered or if you've read the book and want to hear my thoughts in more detail, I'll leave a link in the cards above for you. I had a lot of fun making that video. It was very chill. It was nice just getting to sit down and chat with you quite thoroughly about one book and getting to share the journey of watching it all unfold. So even though I'm thrilled especially about this book, especially given that it was a five star, I clearly didn't read very much last month. And while I do think that there's a couple of reasons for that, the primary one and the reason that my reading literally like ground to a halt is because I got sick and I was like properly sick, like in bed on antibiotics, all of that good stuff for two whole weeks. I did try to read a couple of things. I got started on The Familiar by Lee Bardugo. I've read, how much have I read? 40 pages. I've read a whole of 40 pages. I have never read a Lee Bardugo book before. And this one just sounded interesting. I think it's adult, although we sell it in the young adult section as well. And it's historical fantasy. So I was excited. I kind of had in my mind that I might do another kind of spoiler filled reading vlog like I did with Lonely Castle in the Mirror. But I mean, that was three weeks ago and clearly that, that has not happened. The other book that I got started on, I literally only read one chapter, was Terror Story by Hilary Lecter. Now this I do really want to continue at some point, 100%. Uh, Hilary Lecter is the author of one of my favorite books from a couple of years ago called Temporary. And in fact, I got a comment from one of you saying like, you need to push this up your list. Like, it's so good, you're gonna love it. And I believe you, I believe you, but for whatever reason, me being a bit slumpy, me being a bit sick, the whole mix of it, 
I got one chapter in and just never picked it up again. So I decided rather than starting a third book, I would just let myself not read for a while. Imagine that. Before I got sick, I basically had three videos that I had just started, either reading for or two of them I was filming for. As I mentioned, one of them was like a literary sci-fi reading vlog. One of them was going to be just a spoiler-filled reading vlog for The Familiar. And the other one I started filming on the Sunday before A15 and I was going to talk about A15 and I was going to read some more Palestinian books. And so now that it's been like three weeks since I was working on those, I kind of feel like I'm not sure which ones to pick up or which ones to just kind of scratch and do something different. For like the Palestine reading vlog, like is A15 relevant anymore? Like right now, do people still want to hear about what happened in Melbourne or should I just like do a separate Palestinian reading vlog, start another one? You know what I mean? But on top of that, I, I'm still not reading. I have not started reading yet, even though I've been off antibiotics and feeling mostly myself again for the last, you know, five or six days. I just kind of don't want to read right now, which is obviously not the end of the world, right? But like, it does make it a little hard to make booktube content. So I think there's a couple of other things going on and I just wanted to kind of chat through them with you if you'll allow me. I think one of them is something that if you've been following me for you know several years and you're very clever you might have figured it out yourself is that this seems to happen to me pretty much every year around April May. April May just kind of I get a bit down I get a bit tired and I just kind of don't want to read as much and I mean that makes perfect sense right like for us here in the southern hemisphere in Australia like that's when we're moving into autumn and into winter April is literally when daylight savings ends, so like our days very much change in April and so I think this time of year I just always struggle with motivation and like attention and interest and I think this year I just I don't want to like fight myself on it I just kind of want to like let myself retreat and move inwards a little bit. But on top of all of that, I think there are two other things that are kind of going on that are making filming a little bit difficult for me right now. The first is undeniably the genocide in Palestine. Obviously, if you've been here for a while, you'll know it's something that I care about a lot. It's something I'm very engaged with. And like, yeah, seeing the things that we're seeing right now are definitely having an impact on me, like emotionally, spiritually, as I'm sure they are most people. But as far as my video making, I think it's even more than that. I think making videos is something that I love to do, but it's also something that requires quite a bit of energy and time for me. And there's been several times where I've kind of just felt like, what the fuck am I doing? I should be out doing something much more tangible and useful. I should be out at a direct action. I should be using my spoons on that rather than sitting down and making another book video. I think especially given the fact that I only work part time, so I do have the time to be out at direct actions, which is why I've been attending. But because I'm disabled, I only have so many spoons to spread around on all of the activities that I wanna participate in, that I wanna do. And so filming, especially when it comes to big elaborate vlog videos with like, you know, fancy hooks and a big conceit or whatever, just have felt like not a priority for me. That's not to say that I wanna stop doing this at all, but like, it's, it's a factor, right? It's a factor in feeling like this isn't necessarily the thing that I should be investing most of my time and energy in right now. And then the second thing is something I'm not sure how much I want to talk about at length here, but I think it is definitely playing a factor and that is my recent autism diagnosis. I feel like I'm learning a lot about myself and I'm like reframing a lot of my experiences in a way that makes a lot more sense and is helping me. But as I'm doing all of this learning, I'm finding that there are so many things that I have been like forcing myself to do and forcing myself through my entire life. And to be clear, it's not that before I could just push through them and that I was fine. It's that I was pushing through things that I didn't realize they were having as much of an impact on me as they were. And I was like having like an accumulative effect later. And so I'm just less willing to put myself through all of that now. And obviously this sort of stuff is coming up a lot in my everyday life and like figuring out how to navigate all of these things now with this new information. It's a lot, it's a lot, but it's also coming up all the time when I go to film. It can be anything from like the lights and setting up the lighting that I usually film with. Sitting there and filming in front of these bright lights for an hour or two, I used to, it used to ruin my day. I used to do nothing else for the rest of the day after filming. So Sometimes it bled into the next day and I could just like knock it out of bed for the next day. And so that's why I've been filming in front of the window a whole lot more. I'm still kind of like got my computer screen on to brighten it up a little bit and this is giving me a headache too and I hate it. But like I, I'm trying to figure out how to balance my own needs and not ruining the rest of my day with still like making the kind of videos that I want. I'm also just kind of renegotiating my own experience of like how I want to present myself on camera too. The camera absolutely flattens out your expressions and everything. Like that's just a fact. So I've learned over the 10 years that I've been on camera that I've been making YouTube videos to like amp up my expressions a little bit. I know that when I'm passionate, which I often 
and am about books, whether I love them or hate them, I, I have been told that I can come across as if I'm like angry when I'm not. So I often try to like overcompensate for that. Like all of this is just masking stuff, right? And it's just interesting to kind of become aware of the ways in which I do this literally for the camera. It's funny because in so many ways I feel like one of the reasons I love YouTube and have always loved YouTube is because I feel like it's one of the few places that I can usually present myself in the way that I, I want to be seen. In real life, I really struggle with communication. I stutter a lot. I kind of talk around in circles. I repeat myself. Whereas on YouTube, I can kind of just like do that to the camera and then I get to edit it in a way that kind of makes sense in like a more concise way. And so, yeah, I am different in real life in a lot of ways. Those of you who've been on live chats know that like I am a lot less clear, a lot less direct. In a lot of ways, it almost feels like the YouTube version of me, the version that you see most of the time is the version of me that I, I want to be. I think that's maybe one of the reasons that I have loved YouTube as much as I have for as long as I have, because I feel like it's the place that I, I get to really present my ideas and in a way that I, I usually feel like I can be understood. I don't always feel that in real life. And I know that's because I struggle to communicate. I feel like the editing process literally helps me feel understood. And so I think essentially what I'm saying is at least for the next little while, I don't know how long that will be. I think I'm just going to have to take YouTube a little more casually. I think my videos uh, might not be as like on time as once every week on a Saturday night and they might feel a little more casual, a little less edited, a little less polished. And I think I'm just gonna try to figure out a relationship with YouTube and filming and editing and the whole process that, that works for me now that I have this new understanding of myself. Rather than continuing to force myself to a particular you know, schedule or to a particular standard or to a particular kind of video. So this is gonna be a process. I'm not sure how much of it is going to be evident to you because I don't even know. I don't even know what this process is gonna look like. All I know is that I can't keep living and doing everything in the same way that I have been. I do have a handful of books that I like in my head would really like to read in May, uh, but like, I don't want to put any expectations on myself right now, given that my reading pace has been so slow and I literally haven't read anything in more than two weeks. But the book that my patron and I were supposed to be reading together in April, I haven't started yet, is Beyond Survival. And like, I have been looking forward to this book so much, so I do really want to get to it. Our book for May is actually a young adult book, which I'm excited about. It's A Snake Falls to Earth. So if I'm going to be reading anything, I need to prioritize these two books. Obviously, I do already have these two books, Terror Story and The Familiar like started, so it would be great if I could actually get through those two. And then of course, Lightfall book three has just come out. It came out on Tuesday. I'm filming this on Saturday. I haven't read it yet. Lightfall is my favorite graphic novel series. What I have in my head that I would really love to do is reread the first two and then read the third one. We've been waiting for this for like two years. I'm so excited. Like literally this is my favorite graphic novel series. Like nothing comes close to Lightfall. So of all the things that I have on my TBR, this is definitely the one that I'm most excited about right now. But anyway, I can feel myself fading. So I'm going to wrap up here. Thank you so much for hanging out with me, making space for me to chat about some of this stuff. Let me know if you have any thoughts in the comments comments below. Of course, a massive thank you to my wonderful patrons over on Patreon and especially big thank you to Livia, Lynette Brown and Marie. Until next time, I'm, I'm not going to say happy reading because like I'm not reading at the moment. I'm just going to say be kind to yourself and I will talk to you soon. Bye.